going to have a number of different things, but the principal presentation will be made by Mr. Mike Kudak, the General Superintendent of Mountaineer, which is a division of uh, Consolidation Coal. And Mr. Kudak is a graduate of uh, very glad to have him tonight. Before he speaks, let me just describe in general, he'll present the matter in the best way that accords with him, but we'll probably have a, a he'll come on first and, and uh, discuss uh, the uh, extraction process, production, and the management approach to getting out the coal and the various kinds of equipment and, and jobs that counter in uh, the uh, production method. Now, we'll have a, after he finishes, we'll have a couple of films. One is a very outstanding one that can solve produced. Another is a short 10 or 12 minute one from uh, Bureau of Mines on Cold Mining, which also presents some of the same kind of material. And uh, we'll at an appropriate point, take a break in there, and then we'll have some pamphlet material for you, which are produced by the National Coal Association, and will vary from coal in the environment, coal in research, and a reprint from a encyclopedia on coal, to a simple map that will give you an idea of the coal areas of the country. We're very grateful to Mr. Hudak for being with us tonight and for bringing along some display materials that I think help understand what he's going to speak to. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Must have left this thing. Oh, here On behalf of Consolidation Coal Company and Mountaineer Coal, it was real nice of you to ask us to help you out with your class. We are real glad to help out. I'm so it's so different to look back and see so many women in the class, young ladies. And we don't see this when we go to the mines and talk to the people, discuss production with them, discuss safety, training. But it is nice to see them here tonight. Maybe they're in, a little interested in mining. We are in a demand industry where mining is booming. We can't seem to get enough coal. Prices are going up. Costs are soaring out of sight. By the same token, we're dedicated that we're going to try to get everything that we need for this country. We want to do it. Before I go any further, I'd like to introduce a young engineer from South Dakota School Mines, Mr. Darrell Dock. Darrell's going to help tonight. He's been with Mountaineer for now for about four years. And later on, we get into some question sessions. Maybe Darrell can answer some of them for you. You know, we take a lot of people into the mines visitors from time to time. And you travel through the mines and you maybe travel a couple of miles. And all at once they look at you and you look at them and they're kind of puzzled, their faces all wrinkled up, you know, and you say, well, what's the matter? Well, they look at you and they say, yeah, are we in the mines? I say, yeah, you're in the mines. Well, they say, where's the coal? Well, you, you stop at that point, you have to explain to them that what they expected to see was something real dark and something real dungy, something real dreary this they don't see. They see very white walls, whiter than these walls, in fact. And you, you shine your light on them, and the light reflects all over, and you see large headings and the uh, top that's maybe as high as this in places. And uh, it's different than what you would imagine. It's just an entirely different picture than what people think about mine. As we go along tonight, if anybody has any questions, I wish you to just bring them out as we go along. And uh, if, if we don't know, we'll say we don't know the answers to them. If we do, we'll try to explain them. Before. And uh, maybe we can all get together then later, or, or at, when this whole thing's over after the presentation, maybe we'll just have a complete question session. And you can't ask questions about it. But what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, I like to talk about five or six different things at times. 
And I want to make this rather fast because we do have two films, and then I'd like to draw some pictures for you about how you mine coal. First of all, I want to define production and tell you what a mine is. I want to look into the past of mining just a little bit, what's taken place in the last hundred years. I want to talk about today's mining methods and perhaps even look at a movie on that. We want to look at a modern mine map, go over, go over the planning projections, what development is, what pillaring is. And if time permits, maybe we can even get into a little bit of the future in coal. What do we expect in the future? What's machinery going to look like? What's the tonnage have to be in the future? What's the industry going to need in order to survive? Way of, way of production. After Mr. Ross asked me to teach his class for him a lecture, I sat down and I started thinking about what production was. And I defined production as the combined effect of manpower with the equipment to win the coal from its natural position and make it available for the customer or the consumer. Now that's a lot of words, but it all goes together from the beginning. You combine manpower and equipment. If you look around the room, I put up these various posters, continuous mining, over here long walling, over here uh, our conventional equipment, the haulage equipment, and in every case you see men with it. You see none of it by itself. Every bit of it has to be manned at, just at this stage in, in the development of mining. And coal doesn't win easy. It wins very hard. You fight the elements, you're fighting top conditions, you're fighting water, you're fighting gas, methane. So when we say win it, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to win every ton of it. That brings us to the next next point that I want to talk for just a minute. How do you measure production? What's it measured in terms of? Well, I'm sure all of you, well, maybe all of you haven't either, bought a ton of coal. And that's exactly the term. It's bought in terms of ton. We price it by the ton. We mine it by the ton. We sell it by the ton. And if you've ever been around the beer gardens or around the bowling alleys and you hear the miners talking, you hear one of them say to the other one, how are you fellows doing? And they don't mean how are you physically or how do you feel today or what's the mind look like. What they're talking about is how many tons are you fellows getting? You getting 6,000? You getting 7,000 tons? Are you satisfied with what you're getting, what they're asking each other? Are you getting enough to make costs, to make a little profit? I'm just a little curious. Does anybody here really know what the annual production and work in terms of tons of the world is? Would anybody know? It's like how much? Let me write down a couple of zeros and see if you recognize it. <coughs> see if you know how many this is. That's a lot of numbers. That's two billion tons. This is the world we're talking about now. The United States, about 300 of this, 300 million. Or excuse me, excuse me, 600 million. Russia, about 600 plus million. In fact, they're a little over United States production. China, about 400 million. Well, you can see we're up to we're up to a billion six hundred thousand right here already. So that doesn't leave an awful lot of coal for the rest of the world to mine in order to get this to billion. So that kind of puts you in a little perspective of, of where the United States sits in the world production of coal. And it's estimated that in the next ten years this will be up to one billion by itself. A thousand million tons in other words of coal. 10 years from today. Now it's took us, since coal was discovered, to get to this. We've got 10 years to get to this. So you can, you can all see what mechanization is going to have to do. It's going to have to really get tremendous. What, what this figure will be at that stage of the game, I have no idea. I haven't even read about it. 
maybe y'all can research this project. Something for you to look into. What these countries will do, I have no idea. This is what the United States has to go for. Now getting a little closer to home, West Virginia, for instance, we go about a hundred million tons. Which is a pretty good slug of six hundred. West Virginia right now will rank second to the state of Kentucky in, in, in mine and coal. That's happened in the last three or four years. Now you might ask, how much coal does a mine get? Well, a mine can run upwards of anywhere from a few hundred ton a year to as high as four or five million ton a year, a single coal mine. A single section, for one of these pieces of equipment can average maybe 250 to 500,000 ton a year per unit of equipment that you have. Where do you pull that shut back there? Now you might ask, where, where's all this coal coming from? And these figures I can't even remember, it gets tremendous. But the production, the reserves of the world, I just want to just show you what, what mining could look like. Reserves of the world are estimated to be. Can y'all see these figures back there? That's a trillion, three hundred billion tons. And this is what they define as re recoverable reserves. Now, this, the, the total reserves of the world are are even. And more enormous than this, they're, they're tremendous when you start getting tonnages or seams less than 25 inches thick and, and what they think might be there, not what they know is there. This is the figure that's already been proved. And these figures are up to date as of last January from the Bureau of Mines and Resources and it was taken out of a, a new magazine, the World, World Coal Publication. So you can see that, that the figures are tremendous. Looking at just the United States alone, they figure there's 433 billion tons. And, and we're mining less than 1 billion ton a year right now. Less than a billion. So we do have a lot of years. No reserves in this country. For instance, this is even greater now. This past summer, you probably heard on the radio, <coughs> they made a big coal find down in Brazil. That, that had millions of tons in it. That's not even included in these figures because this was as of January 1st of last year, 74. So that kind of places us in perspective of what we're talking about that we have to do and can do. West Virginia's reserves are something like 40 billion. <laughs> so if all the production in the United States came just from West Virginia, you have 50 years, over 60 years of coal here, just known reserves. Now that's not what's on down deeper, what hasn't been drilled yet, what hasn't been proven to be there. Where do we rank reserves, West Virginia? In the, in the country? Yeah. Very, very shallow, really. Some of your western states, Montana, Wyoming, they have tremendous reserves compared to West Virginia. This would be, well, we're not, we're not last, but we're not by near the top. We just produce more. Well, Kentucky's ahead of us in production. What's it do? Fletch weight between the you'll, you'll find, I think, as your class goes on here from week to week, how West Virginia got to be in this position. I think Mr. Ross will probably bring this out in later classes. I would imagine, since it deals with the people and, and, and the industry itself. But it has kind of grown right into West Virginia. And if West Virginia doesn't do something, we're not going to keep the lead. We're not going to hold where we're at now. Because we are in a high sulfur coal area, we are hampered by conditions, hampered by manpower, and we take uh, some of these big strip mines from Gwyn out west, where, where we get 10 tons a man or 12 tons a man a day, they can get 60, 70, 80 ton a man a day. And we can't compete with those kind of prices. The only thing in our favor right now is the fact that they have no way to transport this coal from out there back east. That's the only reason we're still in the market we are.
We said a little bit earlier that production or extraction <coughs> consists of basically two things. One of them, we have to dig the coal, and we have to win it. And the second thing we have to do, we have to get it outside. And to get it outside, we use, we use several different methods. We either use belt lines, or we use haulage, and we dump them with dumps. We bring the coal out in shafts, slopes, or skips. We'll get into that in just a minute. Oh, oh, excuse me. One thing I forgot to tell you. Out of this 600 billion tons here, about half of that is deep mine coal, and about half of it is strip mine coal, which puts us about 300 million tons we're going to talk about tonight. It's about mining. Now, 10 years ago, this wasn't true. Strip mining didn't account for 50% of the total. It was maybe 35 or 40%, and it's constantly growing every year. And it will continue to grow for several years especially when the western coals come into us. Yes? Oh, uh, it's been fluctuating. It adds up and down. Now, recently I read an article where uh, major companies are buying more coal reserves than they're producing. Is this indicative of the this coal in the last? I would think so, yes. I see no reason that it wouldn't, but this is, this is the only thing we really have to go with. Fossil fuel type energy. So we're going to confine our talk the rest of the night to this 300 ton of deep mining coal. I'd rather not even talk about strip mining tonight. I mean, it may be mentioned in the movie, but I'd rather not talk about it. There were my one answer questions on that. Now, where does the 300 million tons come from? Well, like we said, it comes from small mines of maybe 100 tons, up to mines that produce a neighborhood of 18 to 20,000 ton a day of production. And 18 to 20,000 tons is a big pile of coal. It's a big kind of coal. I can't describe it to you, but you just have to see that kind of thing to do it. Now you might ask, well, where is the coal and how do we get to it? This is the very simplest form of mining, and I'd like to just show you this and move on to something else. Let's say, for instance, here's a mountain. Okay, here's the seam of coal. And there's another big seam down here. Somebody else wants to tap into it. Little Joe over here wants to, wants to put a mine in. Okay, what's the cheapest, easiest mine for him to put in? Okay, it's a mine right here on the mountainside. He comes up here and he doses this off, and makes him a bench. And right here he starts mining back in the field. Starts scratching coal out right here, going in here. This is called a drift mines. Now, for these seams down here, of course, there's no way he can do this. It costs tremendous sums of money to get into deeper coal seam and flow. For instance, a single shaft may cost a million dollars. A slope may cost you two million dollars to get into it. Now, a shaft, a shaft is a straight. It's a head frame and you put skips in it. Of course, some people slope. Of course, you can see the difference in cost, why it would cost so much to put a slope into the coal center. So we have these three different types of mines that we can talk about or look at tonight. Mm -hmm. Drift, shaft, and slope. Any questions so far? Now, once we get to the coal, or into the coal, then we have to develop. I think the best way to show you how you develop is to look at a mine map. We have one over here on the wall I put up a while ago. It's a mine map of the Loveridge Mine, Mountaineer Coal. This mine was started in about 1957 and entered right at this location. Since this time, there's been about 40 million tons of coal taken out of this mine. Now, where does the coal come from yet? What comes from what's known as reserves? Every company has so many reserves. This being the reserves that uh, dedicated to the Lovery Mine. And every one of these little blocks that you see on here, these lines, there's been a machine to cut that, drive that. Because the engineers then they come in the mines and they plot these on them. I, mean, I locate them very precisely with instruments, come outside and they draw this plan view of the mines. So the map just like these up in airplane looking straight down in the mines. You take the top off of it, this is what you'd see. Amazing these 
Heading to the Lord. The miles are heading to the Lord. Miles. I don't know how many how many miles are here. I can tell you from here to down into here, it's about five and a half, six miles long. It's about five miles long into here right now. These areas where you can see that are blocked out, glued out, that's what's been caved or pillared. And this likewise has to be mapped. Why? You've got to stay within your boundaries. You must leave border areas. We'll get into more of this as we go along. Somebody earlier asked me, what's all these little dots? Some of them are just colored and some of them is just uh, steel white looking. Well, every one of these little dots on here that has a little square around it is a gas well. This is We have to contend with those. We've got to mine around them. We can't mine through them. So we have to lay them out ahead of time, know where they're at, and then provide 200 feet square block or almost an acre coal for each one of these wells. We have to leave this. We can't take this. That's about 10,000 ton of coal for every one of these wells at the state of mines. At the rate leverage produces coal, that's about one day's production for every dot on that map. It produces about 10,000 ton a day, 10 to 12,000 a day. So every one of those dots just represents a day that that mine doesn't get to work. What a monster. And once we go off and leave them, like you see back where we pillared out, that coal can never be recovered again. Be completely uneconomical to ever go into those areas. Top cave that just fell, fell tight. The roof fell against the floor. The next thing we have to do in order, in order to maintain coal mines, we have to ventilate. We have to ventilate every single heading that you see in here that's not caved already, to seal it off. Every single one of these entries has to maintain air and move. Has to move. Has to flow like water moves. Because if it doesn't, they'll fill up with gas. In a mine like that, right now at this stage, we have almost two million cubic feet of air in that coal mine. A minute to pass through it through big fans. And right now we're in the process of putting two more fan installations in. This mine will have ventilation of about three million cubic feet of air a minute in another year from now. You don't think that gets cold on a zero day, just winter kill block. The next thing we have to do in mine like that, we have to control the roof. The life of the mines depends on how well we keep the roof from in on us. And to do this, we have various control techniques. This machine right here, for instance, you see the man putting in what's known as roof bolts. You can look at these pictures later when we take a break. You'll see this fellow putting up roof bolts. This is one of the means of helping control roof. This machine here puts them in. Of course, you have conventional posts and timbers and, and uh, just various ways, steel arches if, it, if need be. But you have to develop, you have to ventilate, you have to control the roof. And the next thing you have to do, you have to haul the material out of the mines, which we talked about. You, you have to have all these before you even have a full mine. Tremendous sums of money, these three they have. Now, let's go on into the section itself. Just, just one section of, of the mines. Before we can produce any coal in this section, I've, I've just outlined about eight things here that I feel like you have to have on those particular sections in order to be able to produce coal. First thing is supervision. Equipment. We must control the roof. We must control the water. We gotta ventilate the section. Then you got a couple other things that you have to have to produce coal. You must have Crew size and let's put ability here. Well, the crew wouldn't be worth 10 cents if they weren't trained how to produce coal. I could take you all in the mines tonight, unless you could work in the mines, it'd take days before we could operate that section. 
It's literally days for whatever produces a ton of coal product. And the last thing that I put down that I, I know has a big factor on, it's not so much of producing coal, but on the amount of coal that you can produce, and that's the morale of the people. And it's very hard to keep this squirting around in mind. It's very hard to keep that, that one thing. Now before we look at the movie, does anybody have any questions up to now? I think we can look at the movie here in a little while and probably get more out of it. Let's just look just real briefly here into the past and pull on what what's done. All of you read about the pick and the show. Well, they had that for, for years and years and years. And the next thing they added was a, was a cart or a wheelbarrow. And then they, they would either they would put the coal in the cart and they'd push it outside. Then somebody put a mule or a horse or a pony with it and they started pulling the coal outside. And then you, after the general electricity came into general use, they started putting electric haulage into the mines. And they put them in what they call electric motors. Small things of these. This is maybe a 50 ton motor today, but they had small these units. They'd pull maybe one cart out at a time or two carts, and somebody keeps getting bigger and everything, everything just keeps growing. So then later, some, and of course at this time they still loaded coal by hand. And then pretty soon somebody decided they'd put cutting machines in the coal. So they added cutting machines in to cut the coal. And then later in about night, in the mid 1920s, they added mechanical loading. They added loading machines to load the coal and place a hand loading. And then in the mid-1940s, they got off, off track equipment. They went to these rubber tire units. You notice today everything's on rubber tires, all your equipment, all except your loading machines. And then in the 1950s, you got continuous miners. That's when some of these started coming in. These, this, these pieces of equipment, these, this, these machines. And until the present time, the only real new invention in mining, other than refinements of continuous miners, has been the long wall. It came in in the 1960s into this country. And it's becoming more mechanized every day. You might look at these pictures here. Just take a typical long wall. Here's a short wall, one installation short wall right here. A unit like this, just to let you know what it costs to, to put one of these into production. Three years ago, you could buy a complete setup like you're looking at right here. Jacks, machine, conveyor, gate entries, gate machines on the ends. You could buy one of those for less than a million dollars. Today, you get a quote, you'll pay over three and a half to four million dollars for it. This is within about three years period of time. This is how the price of equipment has gone out of sight. You say it came into this country. Where did this come from? It came from basically Europe, from Germany, from Russia, from uh, from France, England. They they didn't have it refined like it is today. It's, it's all mechanized today to the point that the, that the jacks move themselves. I think the movie will show it a little later on in more detail. And then we can, you can ask questions about it a little later and you may not draw something like this, but that's the that no sense to it. <clears throat> let's, let's look at the movies then that Mr. Ross provided. Why don't, we, why don't we take a short break, say 10 minutes? And while we take this break, if you all want to look at these pictures of the various types of machinery that's in the mines, this all continuous mining, this all dealing with just haulage, and this dealing with conventional units. And then we get back to getting, I want to ask the question about what you've seen from the movie about what you see on the bulletin boards, and then maybe we can do some other things too. Size of crews, people it takes to run these mines, that sort of thing. The show was uh, for the rural areas, and like, just because, you know, he's from Fairmont, and I said, do you, I said, uh, there's a lady from Summersville who drives two and a half hours to go to Shinston Clinic because she cannot get an appointment with a local doctor. Now that's a long way to drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are coming up from a 75 mile radius just to the Shinston Clinic. Mm -hmm. And on the Fairmont Clinic, people come from Doddridge County. Mm -hmm. And 
all over. And I said, so how can you say that? I said, don't you know what's going on? And I said, how can you be a member of this committee and not know the facts? And uh, like there's a, there's a $50,000 study that's going to be starting in that. You know, this is the thing I want to keep on emphasizing too. I don't think it's a matter of shortage of physicians. I think we need the PA. That's what I want to keep on saying. I mean, we want to, you know, you could, to make this a little more ridiculous or emphasize it instead of saying ridiculous, but do you th it might be considered by some that if everybody that worked in a hospital from the orderly on up to the doctor would be, should be go to a four year medical school and take a training all the way through with it. You could make a case for that. So, but, so but every person the patient came in contact with was a doctor. Yeah. Or should we? So that would mean that the patient is getting the absolute best care of them. So if anyone comes in late, if you notice, we'll be glad to see that they get them. No one around here has ever seen the four varieties of coal, so uh, some of you may not have seen uh, uh, peat and lignite, though, which are on, on the top of these samples we have. There's some sets of samples here you can see out of class. And they, compare both uh, peat and uh, lignite, which the lignite reserves are very big in the, in the western part of this country. Otherwise, it's about two minutes last night. Before we continue with uh, Mr. Hudak's presentation and discussion of the questions, I just wanted to, uh, while your mind was fresh on some of the things you saw in the film, uh, because there are later lectures and sessions coming up that some of this will relate to and if they get lost and not reoccur sufficiently in front of you then. Uh, remind you about some of the jobs which you might keep in your mind. One of them, if you remember in the first film, was the roof bolter, which they were showing under pretty dusty conditions. Going, Remember, he's drilling in out of the coal into the uh, rock uh, above. And uh, I'm not discussing what the impact of the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act is on that kind of thing, but you might keep in mind why physicians are going to be particularly concerned about two occupations, not about black lung, <coughs> but about a much more serious disease, and that would be the roof poker and the, uh, uh, the motorman. In none of these pictures have you yet seen a motorman breaking, you see, and, uh, and even that's undergoing some change. But you might keep in mind, because of practices we'll discuss with you, why these people are exposed in particular and have been, but they've been out for many years, to uh, things that everybody's more concerned with than being exposed to coal dust. Um, there are uh, similar things. Uh, we got into a little bit of stripping here because this was a general console film with uh, all of the warnings I give you about both sides of the question. It's Consal has also given you the, the uh, salt and sell on, uh, on strip mining here in its own way. Mr. Kudak's not trying to answer this. I think he's very uh, correctly pointed out what we're dealing with is a 300 million. We gotta, we're going to very carefully try to present uh, both sides of the uh, stripping issue because uh, we want to do that fairly. And uh, I think the rest of this discussion, if we can, we want to try to answer your questions and get as much discussion. We've already asked some uh, good ones to get it going. And stick with uh, with some of the things you've seen or anything else that Mr. Kudak wants to present to you based on the film. Who about everything right off that like to talk about what you looked at or what the soul of the wall here is going to break? Conventional mining is just about just about out. It's just a small percentage of basically the new law made it almost impossible to conventional mine because of the maybe I can show you here in the diagram. For instance, let's just have a three heading. Now, conventional means that you come in here, first thing you do, you come in here and you undercut this place with a cutting machine. 
tractor machine leaves, he goes back over here. Follows him, in comes the drill. He drills, he drills a series of holes. Of course, the cut machine goes here, and the cut machine moves out of there, and he comes back into here. The drill goes from here, then he goes back over here. And you just work everything in a great big round cycle, in and out, in and out, move across section. As soon as it's done, then this is shot down. After you do that, then the roof holder comes in, or excuse me, a load machine comes in. They clean it up, buggies. Now, before the new law came into effect, you didn't have to have any set amount of ventilation in the face. That was just so you didn't have any gas. It's just so you didn't have any noxious fumes from your shooting. So what you do, you put you off what's known as a, as a check curtain or a line curtain. You'd run it off, the air coming through here, would come up and around and out. When you come in to load, you take this check curtain out. Of course, these other places had the same thing. Or maybe they didn't have anything. There wasn't anything in there to clear. Now, when the new law come in, it says you have to have 3,000 feet of air, cubic feet a minute is what it means, within 10 feet of the face. So now you've got to keep ventilation in the face all the time. So this almost eliminated conventional mining where where you now have to go in each place so often that it's almost impossible to keep this 3,000 foot and, and be able to haul coal and work through these curtains and these, and these ventilation devices. And this just about eliminated conventional mining. So in answer to your question, West Virginia and this area has gone to basically this machine, and this one, and the boring machine is in real practical use here. This is this is Consol. This is Mount Miracle's bread and butter machine, the board machine. And Christopher Vision uses a lot of this machine, the chain rippers. What you're going to see a lot of coming in is this. We've got uh, what's my call? These machines will load you. The boring machine, we average maybe 300 tons of shift of those. That, that's a decent shift production. This long wall that we've got set up, we've got a couple of them now. They'll run you anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 ton of shift, a section shift. So even though you've got to pay three and a half million dollars to put one in, you see what kind of tonnage you get from it compared to some of the other machines. So you're going to see a lot of this starting in a lot longer. Hi, Mike. Don't know if you're going to take the long wall. Yeah. Okay, I want to show the structure. Okay, conventional, and let me just show you what you had to have with conventional mine. Conventional, you need a cutter. Cut it off. You need a cutter helper. Helper. You need a, a loading machine. Loading machine operator. You need a, uh, a driller. You need a shear. Shuttle cars. Somebody out. Let me see. Two bolt. This is the best you can do by by law of a contract. Try to get by them. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. An eight to nine man crew, depending on whether you want to combine the job and shoot or not. In one job. It takes at least eight men. Perhaps nine and even. It, uh, there's even some states that have laws that you must have two men. Which means you have to have two men on this, two men on that. The shooter's always a single job because of the dangers involved in shooting. You know where it's shooting double going to end up. So you can see you've got nine men. Now, if you go to conventional, or excuse me, continuous mining, you need a minor operator, a loader operator, two shell cars, and two bolts. That's six men. So you can see what's what's happening. You'll get just as many tons this way as you will that way, and you'll do it with less men. And why do you do it? Because you concentrate your mind. Now, uh, you have two ways you mine with that picture back up. Now with, uh, let's say this place isn't drilled yet, let's say it's just like so. Now with the, with the continuous miners, especially with the borders, 
you come into this place, you cut the corner, and you drive this place in here 100 feet before you ever have to stop to pull out. And it's, it, you can do this because of the, of the natural support of the heading. And would you cut a top, which, is, which, is, which has a circular dimension to it, and you get great strength. In other words, you get loads that hit here, these stresses are, are transferred into the rib, into this location. And of course, then after you come out of here, you come in and you bolt this, so that the next time you cut through, you cut into this area that's folded already to start your next place. And you just keep working yourself. You work this place, you work this one and this one, and you come back across and start over again. You just keep the machine in the cold all the time. So it has a lot of advantages. You're going to see more of the long wall. But the thing that's going to hurt this is, is trying to get the units. Right now, if you were to order a long wall, you probably wouldn't get it for 18 months. And if you try to order some shovel cars to go with it, you probably wouldn't get them for 30 months. Maybe 36 months. We didn't get into that, but that's about the same as a conventional, excuse me, about the same as a continuous miner. You need, you need two men to operate the, uh, the shear, two operators. You need uh, two or three chalk pins. Let's, let's put uh, two chalk pins down. And you need one head gate, one tail gate. That's six men, basically, or seven men if you want. So it's about the same as a continuous section. And you'll get in the neighborhood of three to four times as much coal per day from it, per ship. These, these long walls are loaded up to as much as 9,000 ton of coal in a 24-hour period. One, one second. Are you going to discuss the limitations of transportation, what it does to production? I can a little bit. You mean dealing with belts or what? Yeah, what right. They, uh, how you're able mm -hmm. to keep your, say, continuous management operation, or what the hindrances are. We can't and talk about that. Let, let me just show them the structure a little bit of a, <coughs> one more asking here before I mention about, about mine structure. Of course, mine structure, you have a superintendent. This is at the mine itself. Superintendent, and then you have uh, your mine foreman. You have your shift foreman. You have your section foreman. And you'll have your labor. Now, this, this can vary according to the number of mines mine that you have. Generally, for, for each each five or six labor people, you have a foreman in the mine. And that's generally this fellow. And then this fellow can have, the shift foreman can have 10 or 12 crews on there in row, depending on how many units you have in the mines. The mine foreman's in charge of all the underground mines. He's responsible by law to the underground workings of the mines. And it's the fellow that the state holds liable and the federal holds liable for the mines. The superintendent's board administrator. Now, indirectly, uh, staff positions, you have your civil engineers, you have industrial engineers, you have your safety, safety people, you have your maintenance people, your electrical people. That's just a few. But you can see that it does require a lot of staff position. A lot of these people are in the book. In addition to the circulating air at the main part of where it faces here now to keep down the ventilation of dust? They're not required to wear it. It's provided just with the one. Provided for them. You'll find very few of them will actually wear it. Most of them will say it, it's too hot or they can't spit to back it out. That's where most of them will actually tell you, I don't need that, I chew tobacco. I catch the dust with the tobacco. That's what's fun. You've heard this on many times. This long wall system, is, is that the future in coal mine, heat mine? That's going to be it. Huh? I mean, long wall system, eventually, like, fifteen years from now, we're going to have to have a mine. Well, Mr. Ross asked <laughs> let, let me Let me show you what you have to have to have a mine, and I think I can answer that real. And this will also show your hollies yeah. Maybe I can show you better over here on the big map. I probably can. 
Okay, we get to the bottom of the coal. We take a couple of shafts. We're down in here. Now, we've got all this big block of coal we've got to mine out. We say, how are we going to mine? The first thing we've got to do, we're going to start driving a bunch of what we call main headings. That's these. Multiple entries. They've got to carry large quantities of air. They've got to be well maintained for top. They've got to have good roof control. They've got to be well supported. They've got to last for the life of this coal mine. This mine lasts for 40 years. And these areas got to last for 40 years. You think main entry hollow system. So that's the first step in your hollow system. And your ventilation system together. It's actually a combined system. Okay, so you get out so far and you decide you want to start mining some coal. So you break what's known as sub maintenance. That's what that's these. You see them spurting off. You can see them everywhere. These are called sub maintenance. Right, after you get those rolled, then you drive another set that you call your panel headings, and that's these. And that's where actual production comes from. Of course, you get coal out of these as you go, but it's so expensive and it's so costly to, to do this that, that you make no profit at all in that kind of, that kind of work. All of your coal mining, your, your, your product mining, is all done in these what are called panel headings. Now, these headings are have to stand and be there for upwards of a year. Which it may take us eight months to start here, drive this panel up, and then put her back out again. Now, in addition to this, you've got to drive what's known as bleeders. You notice, you notice the setup heading here? It has no other purpose. These headings will never be mined other than what's mine now. The only thing they'll do, they'll carry gas that's, that's made off this pillar line out of the back and into returns and back to the tank. That's the only purpose of the, of the heading, to be for, for gas purpose. You'll see them all over. You'll see a set here coming out. You'll see them all over the line. Here's a set here out the back. Here's a set here going out the back. The set back here right there out the back. Everywhere you'll see these things. Now, if you're producing coal here, you've got to get that coal <laughs> back to here somewhere. Bring out the lines out this slope. This is a 4,000 foot slope here. If you're producing coal out of this section, You've got to get it here by either a combination of belts or a or track. And whoever's mine uses both. You've got belt haulage and track haulage. All the main haulage being track. Sub main haulage, section wise, and belts. Now you have some advantages to both. If you got track, you've got mine cars, you have a wreck in the mines, you've got a little bit of delay, you've got you've got some time. You've got so many cars in there, you've got storage capacity. You can help yourself. If you have belts and you get a belt break into, you get a fall on a belt somewhere, you can shut the whole mine down all at once. Instantly, the whole mine can be down for days. So you, when you design the mines, you look at two things. You look how much money you got to spend. Because if you, if you go to a track haulage, you immediately have to spend so much money. You've got to buy motors and cars. If, if you go to belt haulage, you can spend money as you develop, so much at a time, 100 feet a week, uh, however fast you drive. You don't have to buy it all overnight. So you'll find that the different mines, it depends how much money they actually have when you went to it, what, what actual kind of haulage they put in. One of them may be better, it depends on your money. Some of you may, um, to go back to the point, not that section of saying it would take close to a year to drive through and then come back and they have trouble realizing that he's talking about a close to a mile in there. It's probably. about 3,000 feet long. Yeah. And there's five or six headings there. Uh, a typical a typical work day all in a, with, a, with a continuous miner, you'll cut maybe 100 feet of coal straight ahead and it's uh, you get about three tons per foot. That's, a, that's about an average type of production unit. It's not good, it's an average. We'd like to see them higher than that. We have them that will cut 200 feet, an average that's. But they have to have real good conditions and real good crews and well-trained people. And, and this we don't have every day anymore. We have something in the mines anymore, it's called job bidding. And qualifications aren't exactly part of it. So if a man bids on another job and and uh, he's ever done it before, to any extent at all, we give him the job. 
whether we can do it or not. Then we have to train. So it cuts down on production. This is what's accounted for a lot of the raise in the price of coal. It's just this inability of our people anymore. What is the job fitting occur? Oh, it occurs any time that somebody else bids off, basically quits, retires. Uh, if, if you're a load machine man, <laughs> we'll post load machine job, for instance. Okay, that may be, may be a uh, shell car man will bid on it. Then we've got to post his job. Maybe a gentleman's job man will bid on it. We, we post his job. You may have to post six or eight times before you ever get that one job filled. Six or eight people change jobs every time you get one job. That's not according to seniority. A lot of it's done according to the same seniority, job seniority. I've heard miners talk and say that. Uh, Try to work their way out of the mine. <coughs> like, like is that true? Like, a lot of them bid your way out. They'll bid with preparation plants or outside shipping. I bet. Yeah, a few of them. They get outside. Uh, getting outside to the nice to get outside, but that work out there is usually a lot harder than to work inside. There's not as much mechanization out there. It's a lot more labor work. So that getting outside is kind of nice to think of. It's generally lower pay. Yes, we, had, we had one fellow, for instance, I'll just tell you, that I won't mention his name, but I'll just tell you about one fellow that did. We had a, a boom operator job outside the tipple, loading railroad cars. And this guy has got to be pretty good because he loads about four tracks at once where cars come under. Big loads of boom coming out here, and railroad cars here, and here, and here. He's got people working down here, moving these cars around. He's got to watch when they're full. He's got to move them down with his crabs and and, uh, and load through different gates into them. So this felt bad. Well, we had a big labor case. And they brought out that the fact that he had stood one day at, at what's known as a belt dump. Where one of these, where one of these belts empties into a mine car inside the mine. One little belt dump now. One little belt comes over and dumps into a mine car. He stayed there a few days and somebody was sick or something. So we took his all the way to arbitration. We lost it. The umpire said we had no right to refuse this man this complicated job outside. So we put him on it. In the first two weeks he was out there, he pushed the emergency stop button in that tip about two or three times a shift. He shut everything. He plugged the jigs up, he shut the screens down. He'd shut everything down that table. He just knocked all the power all at once. He just pushed the big button over here. There she went. So he, he got tired of his boss calling at him, I guess, after he did this a while. So he came to me and he begged me to go back inside the mines. He said, I'll never bid on nothing again as long as I work here. He said, never will I ever bid again. He said, just put me back inside. So I put him back in. I was glad to. And we did a lot of this. <coughs> Anybody else have anything you'd like to talk about? I have a question. What is the life of tickets running and what is the life of long How long can you be in operation before they're outdated and outdated and need repairs? Well, these machines, for instance, for boring machines, they've been in, in general use now for about 20 years in this area. And most of them have probably been overhauled once or twice, probably twice, in fact. And due to the new law of the day, we're having to take every one of these machines back into, into the shops and put what we call canopies on them, cabs, for protective devices. And this takes a complete overhaul. So within the next few years, everything will be overhauled again. Machines never get old. You can't even buy these machines anymore. A machine like this today costs you $500,000. So it's, it's cheaper. Take it in your shop and spend a hundred thousand on it and rebuild it, than it is to spend five hundred for a new one. They don't wear out; it's just a matter of rebuild and changing the components. Of it. Long walls, you really haven't been in use long enough to ever completely need rebuild. The conveyor gets old, they throw it away. Basically, what you do, you put a new conveyor. In. The chalks, there's nothing to wear out. You may have to rehose them, put new jack cylinders in them, but you couldn't wear these top pieces out. They're all solid steel. These bases are all solid steel. And the shearing machine, basically you overhaul it about every panel after you mount a panel up. After a million tons, you overhaul it. The machine never wears out, no matter how much you want to spend to rebuild it. What about the 
Thank you very much, Paul. I was going to say, you might ask me this thing. The question that I feel on this dust, federal regulations on dust now, you have a certain program that you can go to. You have to keep monitoring, like our present time, to keep working on dust. But presently, way longer than this morning. You asked another question about Hollage. And what we feel like is going to be the future of Hollage hasn't even been put underground in practical use yet. And that's this new new hydraulic that you read about the paper. You heard about the hydraulic transportation coal. It's under experiment up here in Ross Run Mine and Mount Near Coal. It's all in Conoco. What it'll consist of will be a machine will be mining coal in here. It'll dump a pile of coal into a surge hopper here out of the machine. This machine will have a big crusher in it. It'll crush this, this coal down. Now, these units are running today up in the mines. I'd say it's never been put into complete mines. At this point, the coal becomes a slurry of water. And from there on, through flexible pipes in this area, back here on a permanent basis and in the great big relay pumps, all the way to the surface, through all these maze of tunnels, this, this material will be piped outside. So it will be a continuous system from the time it's put from the face, put in the conveyor, through the outside. Now, uh, the government is jointly sponsoring these projects because we must have something to increase the tonnage other than what we have today, which is your rubber tire vehicles, which, which leave a gap. From the time from the time the conventional mining machine puts a pile of coal down here until it can be picked up. This one may have to plant 600 feet back here and it's done. So what's the machine have to do in the meantime? It has to shut down when it gets back. So you use two of them. You still have a certain amount. You have a buggy that pulls in here. One goes down here to dump. He goes, fills up. He gets back in here again. You still have waiting times. Too much delay times in between. We have to have something, you know, whole coal continues. We're thinking in terms of, of the hydraulic transportation right off of these units, right off of the long wall. Taking coal right where it dumps, continuous, never stop, right to the outside. What's the size of that slurry? But I, I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, I think it's six inch or six inch. They have some big flexible pipes in mind. all about this big. Ten four inch pipes in mind. Four feet inch. But this is this is what you're going to see more of. Hard to imagine pumping six inches. Yeah, but it makes more sense than what we do. Right? It, uh, we really have a crew, just a just a system that's just been built up over the years. It's it's been changed only because people made it bigger, not because it changed them. They went from little motors to big motors, from little mine cars to big mine cars, from little narrow belts to big wide belts. But never did anybody come up with a new technique for doing. This, this water system. You recirculate the water and all that. Just pipe in, pipe back. How do we continue to monitor the long wall systems from the air from the safety of the water and the health factors? I think you're going to have a session later dealing with, with the health and safety. But just let me say this to you. You can see, I, I guess you look at these pictures. You can see that this man here is typically operating as if he was running his unit. He's under a solid beam of steel. You can look down the jack line. This picture here is a real good picture. Three, and I put it in here. The men walk in this area right here to travel along the face. There's a, it's just like being in the factory, just a solid layer of steel caution. So I don't think it's really a comparison when you start talking about it. Think about it. We can draw your own Much, much more advantageous as long as You might explain then that the convenience miner will have to develop for these more wall sections. I mean, you know it's pretty confusing. Maybe I'll better show them. Mr. Fox, let's go along with This, um, what do they call the, the medical West licensing? Virginia, the medical licensing board suddenly comes out with this job description for all PAs in West Virginia 
that when you finish reading them, you have a person with all this education that is not even uh, allowed by their job description to do as much as a licensed practical nurse, which is a nurse that's had about a year's training and most of it practical and not footwork. The job description gave them no uh, thing that you want to ask question. Yeah, um, now you're, are you the head nurse here, is that right? I am the director of nursing service at the hospital. Oh, and also assistant administrator and when Mr. Cunningham is not present I am acting administrator of the hospital. The hospital. Well, this is what is this the uh, Hampshire? This is the uh, uh, Hampshire Memorial Hospital. It is the only hospital